I want to introduce Hannah Petard with the end of the Washington Post's review of her new <laughs> novel, because it's, it, it's an unbelievable end of review. The reviewer wrote, She's operating at a level few fiction writers attain. Petard deserves the attention of anyone in search of today's best fiction. She's actually been getting that attention since day one, you know this. The Fates Will Find Their Way and Reunion both got rave reviews. They were on every best of list, every read this list, like Indie Next to Oprah. So that's, that's all of it. The only criticism I've ever encountered of her, except for the story she has told me, is a review from an online bookseller that I will not name, which is now her Twitter bio. She writes a little too well, and that is what bothered me about this novel. Which, I empathize, her books are impossible to put down. It can be a problem. So, this is your warning. Um, I'm going to hand this over now to Hannah's high school friend, Eliza Barkley, who's the former editor of NPR's food ver vertical, The Salt, and is now a science and health writer and editor at Vox. She will be great. They will both be great. Please join me to welcome them. So Hannah is actually going to read first. And I have to say that I'm very excited to do this because I've never gotten to talk to a fiction writer in front of others. Except so that we're friends. Except that we're so friends. <laughs> but this is a very special treat. Um, so uh, I, I asked Eliza if she would do this with me, and she was kind enough to. Um, she is one of the smartest people I know, and I've known her for a long time, like five years, right? Because we were in high school that long ago. That's it. Um, and I also asked her to pick out a chapter for me to read or a couple pages based on what she wanted to talk about. And I was really lucky because um, she picked a portion of chapter 12 that I really like. So I'm very excited. Um, apologies in advance for the funny voice. <clears throat> All right, so this is the story of Mark and Maggie. They're on a road trip. Uh, they have gotten a late start. They're driving into a storm, um, a multi-state storm. And like many couples um, who get a late start or even who uh, get a start on time, they are not getting along. And, um, <clears throat> and, now, and actually, I learned this. This is so amazing that I get to have Chris Tillman in the room right now. Um, Chris, you might deny this, but you once told my class, um, if you don't know what to write about, put two people in a car who don't like each other. Something's going to happen. Um, so many years later, two, because I'm really young. Um, <clears throat> so many years later, uh, I wrote this book. And I was in Yak Shop w workshopping a bunch of my own students now. And um, I, I'm always giving Chris Tillman's advice, because people are always saying, I don't know what to write about. And so I'm always saying, ha ha. Let me tell you what I was told. It's great advice. And one of my students said, oh, you just did that. And I said, what are you talking about? And he said, you put two people who didn't like each other in a car, and something happened. And I said, oh, <laughs> I had no idea. I totally did. So uh, thank you, Chris. Um, this, this chapter is for you. Um, all right. <clears throat> oh, let's see. Some things you need to know. I'm sorry, you're never even going to talk to me. Uh, OK, great. Um, Maggie, Maggie has been mugged recently, so she's a little bit paranoid, she's a little freaked out, she's having trouble recovering, and um, Mark is uh, losing his patience for various reasons, um, and uh, Maggie's new obsession has basically been the internet and um, stories of woe. All right, <clears throat> they've just eaten. They'd been back on the road for maybe 10 minutes, 20 max, They'd passed two hotels, both with their no vacancy signs lit up. Maggie thought there was power, but Mark explained it only meant more generators. Anyway, these were piece of shit places, tiny holes in the wall right on the highway like Piney and Motel or whatever it was. And neither Mark nor Maggie had even suggested they stop and make sure there wasn't a room. Maggie had offered to drive to keep, uh, to ke Maggie had offered to keep driving when they left the restaurant. She'd made a little show of it, in fact. Just give me the keys, she said. I've had fewer beers than you. But Mark insisted he take over. She wouldn't admit it, not to him, but the beer had gotten her tipsy. Her tolerance was essentially non-existent. She said she was acting funny only because she was tired, but Mark knew better. He glanced over at her, thinking she'd be passed out, but her eyes were open, and she was looking down at her lap. What are you doing, he asked. Reading, she said. She waved her phone at him. What about, he asked. Do you really want to know, she said. They're, they're 40. They don't have kids. This is how they're talking. They're mad at each other, I guess, because they're in a car. What about, 
Do you really want to know, she said. Jerome, their dog, was snoring. When they got back in the car, he didn't even wake up. It could have been anybody up there in front seats, and Jerome wouldn't have known the difference. It's hard to concentrate with you over there reading, Mark said. Does the light bother you, she asked. The light didn't bother him. There was hardly any light at all coming from her little device. She turned the screen glow down. She was considerate like that. Fine, he said, sure, hit me, read me something. Maggie turned the radio off. They'd been listening to Modern Country by default. Okay, she said. A group of teenagers, I have to do this. I'm sorry, I'm gonna smile and laugh. This is not, it is funny, but it's also not funny, and apologies, it's just hard for me to read this, because she's so obsessed with bad stories, and she takes such pleasure in them. Um, and sometimes I think, how did I even write this? This is, she's so awful. Um, <clears throat> okay, she said, a group of teenagers, high school students, kidnap a college kid and torture him to death. No, Mark said, not that, try again. Okay, Maggie said. She was quiet for a minute. <laughs> this is the story of a young woman who discovers her father has been videotaping her every time he rapes her and it turns out she's essentially famous in the world of internet pedophilia, like the most famous molested girl in the world. Jesus, Mark said, no. Where was she getting this stuff? He read the same papers she did, but he never came across articles like those. Or if he did, he had enough sense to skip over them. I don't want to hear about children getting hurt, Mark said. Anything other than children getting hurt. Okie doke. Maggie poked at her screen. How about this? Google has issued a statement. They were always issuing statements, the big companies, and always about the smallest things. They were afraid they'd be forgotten if they didn't constantly update or reload. What kind of statement, Mark asked. Their maps department is going to stop removing dead bodies from satellite images, Maggie said. Mark had no idea what she was talking about. I can read you the article, she said. Maybe just a summary, he said. Maybe just the bare bones. Maggie was quiet a moment. He could see from the corner of his eye that she was looking at her lap again. Her index finger flicked vertically at her phone. Okay, she said, it's an apology slash statement. They set a precedent several years ago by removing that boy's body in Texas, and they're saying now that it was the wrong precedent to have set. They're saying now that it's impossible to remove all the bodies because there are too many. <laughs> what boy's body in Texas? <laughs> they're saying, this is Maggie. They're saying that the last hurricane makes it a precedent they can no longer live up to, and this is verbatim, nor do we wish to continue to erase the realities of our planet's surface. Can you believe that? No, he couldn't believe it. He couldn't believe that such a thing existed. Why were there photos at all? Why was there a maps department at Google that had any authority to issue statements in the first place? Hadn't the world gotten along perfectly fine before satellite imaging? Did your everyday housewife really require access to professional grade topological views of the earth, to the internet at all? Jesus, just look at Maggie since the mugging, since the college girl. Look how quickly she'd gone from simple browser to consummate addict. Burglaries are up on the north side, Maggie said. Want to hear about that? I'll stop there. Perfect. That was a perfect ending spot. Okay, so, you know, when I read this, I just, it just resonated so much because I think we, we've all observed how the internet can draw people into these really dark places that they would, that sometimes feels like they would never go there and then they stay there. <laughs> like, is that something you've, you've noticed, observed, and, and like, what is your sort of perspective on that? Um, I, so I think that's w one reason, thank you, really good question, Eliza, thank you for asking that. Um, I think one of the reasons that I, I laugh during that, um, section which is really uncomfortable for me to to read and to even remember writing um is because i have absolutely fallen into that trap of you know the the vortex i think is what a lot of my my friends call it um like i lost 20 minutes today to google or man i lost 20 minutes to uh to the interwebs right um and i absolutely am somebody who will lose time to it and I hate that I lose time to it um, but I also like staying informed and I think what's really interesting about Mark and Maggie and specifically Maggie is that she's allowing me to tease out my own um, 
uh, I, I feel guilty because there's a fine line between staying informed and being overindulgent. And at what point are you simply reading another story about something bad that's happened to somebody? And at what point are you just staying informed because it's the smart thing to do? And, and I think that's something that I'm still trying to figure out for me. Um, and whenever, I, whenever I'm asking myself a lot of questions, I end up writing about it in fiction. And, and the other thing that occurred to me reading that is that, you know, the, the bizarre thing about going through something traumatic like like Maggie did, she's she's brutally mugged, is that you know there's this temptation to just kind of relive it, right, and relive trauma, and it seems like that's what she's doing. She's like she can't she can't let go. She's kind of stuck in the, in, in and she's just holding on to other people's trauma while not really like moving on from hers. And and meanwhile, that's like so frustrating to Mark, right? Yeah, it's frustrating. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, is there a question there? Because <laughs> I love that statement. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I guess like that that kind of tension, like in a relationship, right? Where it, it's, it's really fascinating, right? Like one person goes through something terrible, and then the other person just wants them to to move on, and yet that's not how it works, right? It's <coughs> this this happened um, about so ten ten years ago in June. Um, uh, my adoptive dad died, and I was dating. Apologies, mom, Greta, you guys were lovely to him. I was dating not the best person, but somebody who was definitely um, a reaction to about 11 months of cancer and hospice. Um, and I, it's not like I was trying to get anyone's attention. Like, I just, I, I think I was like throwing darts or stones and anybody who even seemed nice to me, I was like, I'll date you, you're great. Um, and, and I remember the day after Pops died, I went back home, or maybe two days later, I went back to Charlottesville, about a three hour drive, and um, I think it was like the first time I'd been alone since he died, and um, my, I'm gonna air quotes boyfriend, because that's giving him great justice that he does not deserve, but um, my boyfriend came over, and I started crying like the minute he walked in, and he said, what's going on? And I said, well, my so my dad died two days ago right um and he said oh so we're still dealing with that <laughs> i only dated him like four more weeks so don't worry about me <laughs> um but i think so all that to say um i will always take every opportunity to tell an anecdote and avoid a question while i'm thinking of a real answer um all that to say it's really hard when you care about somebody and um they've experienced something that you haven't. And I think there's, on the one hand, um, and I don't think I'm wrong about this, if, if, if we're being honest, or maybe it is just me, but there is this sort of, sexy is the wrong word, it's really the wrong word, but there's this um, desire to be close to people who have experienced trauma, because there's this feeling that they've experienced something deeper than you have, or um, whether whether it's something positive or something negative, um, you know, I remember, I remember 9/11 happened. The first thing I did was call everybody I knew in New York who, I knew they weren't even going to be there that day. I just wanted to talk to them, and I and I know on the one hand you're saying, of course, you wanted to make sure they were safe. I don't think so. Not if I'm being honest. I just I think I needed to have talked to somebody who was up there so that. Again, being very honest, I'm, watch me lose readers right now. Like a week later, I could say, yeah, so I, was, I talked to a friend of mine like an hour later. Um, because you wanna be close to it, you wanna have some sort of understanding of it, but you can't. To his, and, and, his, and so I think when you've got spouses and one of them has experienced something, and especially with Mark and Maggie, Maggie has experienced this awful thing and for a little while before the novel starts, she's started to come back, you know, she's getting over it. And, and Mark has been so um, loving and so understanding and then she sort of reverts and um, his sympathy, he wants to be sympathetic and on the one hand, he feels kind of like less than a man because he wasn't there to protect her. Even though that's ridiculous, he wasn't there. How could he have protected her? But on the other hand, it's getting old, right? And he can't help it, but he starts comparing other people's tragedies to hers. Like, well, so-and-so had a miscarriage. She's not acting like you. And at what, like, at what point do we start putting our tragedies on a totem pole? Like, that's so strange, right? 
Okay, and so later in the novel, they actually have to deal with like fear, and their own fear, like again, like in a really serious way. They they go this they're on this road trip. There's a terrible, terrible storm. They can't find a place to stay. They end up having to go down a really scary dirt road. There's a huge truck with like huge lights behind them, and they're like they're going into the unknown. They don't know where they're gonna sleep. Is that your idea of like a super frightful <laughs> road trip? <laughs> when you say it like that, Eliza, it sounds silly. Um, no, I mean, hold on, I, let I me was, let I me just. It, I found it to be clear. I thought it was super scary, but I was also wondering like, is this like Hannah's yes. worst nightmare? Yes. Yeah. Um, I I don't know where my parents picked me up, like what side of the road, because I have a family of people who love the outdoors and they love the wilderness. Um, I am, give me sidewalks, uh, concrete, put me in an apartment building, and that's obvious to anybody who shares my fears because the more people in the apartment building, the less likely you are going to be targeted. There are 30 to 90 other people who might die first. Um, <clears throat> And I don't know. I don't know where you guys found me. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Every Christmas, I'm like, want to go? Want to go camping? Like, do you know me? No, no, I don't. Um, but New York sounds. I f I hear that's really nice this time of year. Um, so yes, there's this moment where uh, Maggie Maggie is insisting on a hotel. She's terrified because they're driving in the storm, and they are. They've now become the only car on a major highway, which to Maggie is terrifying because it's the middle of the night. It's not even the storm, it's that they are the only car, right? So the odds, if you're paranoid, um, I don't have to do a lot of research for this, it's just there. But when you're the only car, you're probably the one that they're gonna look for and do something to. Who's they? I don't know, that's Maggie. Um, <clears throat> so she gets, she is determined to get a hotel and she manages by calling Mark's mother to have a room booked via internet from states away. And of course, what neither of them considers is that it's possible that this internet is working, but that the hotel is not working, or that maybe the hotel is open, but there's not power. Um, and it never occurs to Maggie, she's so excited. I'm gonna have a clean room. I'm gonna have lights to turn on. I'm gonna have a door to lock. And so she's so excited to get off the highway that she is totally th thrown for a loop when they take this exit, and it's a no, no return entry exit. Have you ever seen those on I-64? Because that is, that's my idea of hell. That right there, the one that says no, no re-entry. I'm like, what do they mean? <laughs> what does this mean? Like, I think I just found Hotel California. Like, you really can't get off the mountain. <laughs> what does it mean? I, I'm sorry. So I really, I puzzle over this, and I know this. I'm like, I'm, I am a walking blonde joke. Everyone's like, you just. You, you take the other, the next exit, it's fine, but not at 2 a.m. It's very brutal wording, though. Right, right, it is, it is. So they take this exit, and she is immediately, you know, th this, is a, th this is a moment where maybe they're getting along, Mark and Maggie, but she's immediately, like, walking backwards if she could, but they're in a car, they're stuck together. Thank you, Chris. You can't walk backwards in a car, right? So she's like, get, no, no, never mind, never mind, never mind. But Mark by now is like, I've had three beers. Yeah, this is right, this is great, but we've already paid for it, let's get it, you know? Let's let's do it. And they take this turn, and um, it's like a two-lane blacktop, uh, super narrow, the trees are really low because it's been raining, and then this, uh, so Maggie's hell is my hell. There are beer cans everywhere, and this is not because of litter that I mind, it's because I think, and at least one other person out there is thinking, who left that beer can? And where is that person now? And there are no homes around here. And so I'm on the road. And I'm on the road. And are they just there? And of course, the logical person thinks, well, what are they gonna do? Run up and grab our car? But, but I think they're gonna run up and grab our car. Like, roll up the windows. I know it's 95 degrees. Or maybe they're also driving. Or there. maybe they're also driving. So then, so then Maggie is now like in my personal hell, and then I just added some deer hunter headlights for fun in a big truck behind them, and it's 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 like the trifecta of what I always want to avoid. And uh, the, the internet is is also 
a, a current through the through the whole novel, but in this case, like another another other people's ideas of hell is when like Google Maps stops working, right? right. <laughs> it's so fading, and they're they're on a mysterious road, and Google Maps doesn't work anymore. <laughs> and like I think we, you know, it, it clearly reminded mm. me of like wow, like you know, we're we're so n not used to being lost anymore. Right. We're, we get so anxious in these moments. Ma so Maggie has this um, her she has this minor epiphany. Um, midway through the book or towards the end of the book and she realizes that her husband is terrified of technology and she's terrified of people and her question is how could they possibly survive together in a world filled with technology and people um, <laughs> that's her big it's not an epiphany it's more like oh man <laughs> life is gonna be hard from here on out um, yeah so I'm, I'm curious, I'm changing topics slightly, when you are seeking like a, a sort of deliciously frightful experience like in a book or a novel or, or a film, like what, what, where do you go? And is that, is that like experience you, you kind of create? Because you certainly gave us that like incredibly deliciously frightful experience reading this. I appreciate that. Thank you, Eliza. Um, that's the other tactic I have for buying time uh, by thanking people a lot. Um, I, so, I am somebody who totally signed on after my couple of years at St. John's College to the idea of catharsis, um, that we enjoy certain things as a way to relieve ourselves of the things that we fear, potentially. Um, for me, I'm using fear, obviously, for me. For you, it's a different word. Um, but I love to be scared when I am watching television. And part of it is the, um, and my, my stepfather would love to tell me, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not out to get you, right? And then Joseph Heller, just because you're paranoid. I'd be like, shh, 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 sh no. No, in fact, if I am paranoid enough, if I watch enough Law & Order, um, obviously, no one can break into my home because uh, the, you know, the serendipity would be outrageous. It would just be like, insane to and she was watching law and order the episode when xyz happened and then xyz happened to her so i feel like a lot of a lot of my life for a long time was safeguarding against the things i feared by watching it um or reading reading it uh yeah i love right. to be terrified because obviously now i'm safe i cannot die for instance watch this i can't die in a plane crash tomorrow because a i've just said that and the irony would be outrageous. And two, B, is because I'm writing a book about a plane crash, and that pretty much guarantees one of two things. I either do die in a plane crash, in which case somebody makes a ton of money, um, because my novel just became a bestseller, which is fine, because they're gonna talk about that for a while, and there's a part of me somewhere dead, like, I like it, that's cool. <laughs> I did want that. Um, or B, I can't die in a plane crash. It's fine. I've done it because I've written about one and I said it tonight. So thank you. Sorry to interrupt, but no, no. Okay. One last question for me and then we will open it up. So you are an incredibly prolific writer. I mean, the last time I saw you a year ago, you were like, yep, three down, we're moving on to the next one. And you've got, I don't know if this is number four or number five, the plane crash novel, but as, as a, also a writer who like has to sit and with the internet all day long, like that's just incredible to me. Um, th the rate at which you write books. How do you stay focused? How do you how do you crank them out? And and I will also note that you've been writing fiction since high school, probably long before you have been doing this a long time. But are you also getting faster? That's sort of part two of the question. Oh, that's weird. I mean, and that's a good question, but that's an interesting question. Um, I don't know if I'm getting faster. Uh, I think I think maybe to be honest, I'm getting slower, and I think that's okay. Um, I think I'm starting to be a little less frantic and starting to resign myself to the idea that barring some major catastrophe, it looks like I'm not dying that young. So I can kind of slow down and be a little more patient. Um, I think, uh, I remember when I was at the University of Virginia, I had a couple of classmates who were very rigid. They had these schedules, and I was always very dubious. I, is that would that be the right use of that word? I'm dubious of what they would say. Maybe it is. Maybe it's not. Skeptical. Um, it was. 
they would say things like, well, I get up and I vacuum, I vacuum the uh, living room and then, you know, I make the coffee and by 6 a.m. I've had the bagel and then from 6.30 to 12.30 um, I write uninterrupted in a room with my blinds closed and I'd always sit there like half of me incredibly jealous and the other half thinking, no, no, you don't. Um, and now I realize, yeah, they probably did, uh, but that's not how I operate. Um, I, I tend to write a lot. Um, and then I take time off, and I like the time off a great deal until it starts to drive me crazy or until I start to become a problem to my family. And they say things like, are you, are you depressed? And I say, no, 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 I'm fine, I'm fine. And they say, maybe, have you been writing? Maybe you should do some writing. And I think I take that to mean like, stop calling us. Um, and then I'm like, oh, that does explain why I've been in a bad mood this last 18 month stretch um, and then I start writing again and then I'm in a great mood until I'm in a bad mood again um, because what I'm writing isn't good uh, but I think for me it's really important to take time off and to read and I read and I read and I read uh, and then there will be something and I bet I know there must be other writers in the room I know there are but then there are other writers who I don't know of in the room and I'm sure that everyone has those books they're, they're the two categories of books the one that you read it and you think I don't need you, like for me right now, it's Modiano, and I read Modiano, and I think, I, why even try? Like there's this guy, and he's done it, and um, I'm tapping out. Everybody just go read Modiano, and or Salter. Salter does that to me as well, um, and I think I'm 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 fine. Like it's been done. Um, art was captured here, and I'll just tell people to read this instead. But then there are these other books, and you. I love them just as much, but it's something like a Laurie Moore novel um, or Donald Antrim, and halfway through it, it's not that you don't want to keep reading it, but you, you stand up and you think, oh, I have to go write. I have to do it right now. And so it's one is I'm in awe of, and the other one is I'm inspired of, and they're both great categories. And then there's also, I have learned pretty late in life, if you don't like a book, you don't have to finish it. So there's also that category, which is amazing. But you do keep it because it's a book and it's gotten attached to your other books. So it goes on the shelf because some of us are hoarders and we need all of our books. And, and so this is one last one. So the plane crash is that have you written another one after this one? <laughs> um, so, th so Listen to Me is my third novel. And um, my fourth novel right now is tentatively called Atlanta 1962. Um, and it is it begins with the real life plane crash of Orly Flight uh, 707 out of Orly International. It was an Air France chartered flight. Um, there were 130 people who died. The plane never even actually left the ground, but it did take off and it crashed and it killed 120 of Atlanta's wealthiest art patrons in, in one whoop, as Malcolm X said, um, because Malcolm X saw this as a sign that God was um, coming after the white devil, and those are his, his words. Meanwhile, um, Martin Luther King saw the same incident and said, uh, you know, we need to stop all of our sit-ins. These were Atlanta's best, most liberal um, citizens. We need to bow, bow out for a minute and respect them. Um, and so it, it, and it happened in 1962. And um, surprisingly, I was not alive in 1962. Um, but I remember hearing a lot of stories from my mother, actually, about this crash. And for more than a decade, my mom would tell me stories of these. Um, she could deny it if she wanted to, but I'm not going to give her the microphone, um, of these trust fund hippies who kind of took over Atlanta because they inherited money too soon, money they weren't ready for. So, And maybe it's apocryphal, but man, did it stick with me, this idea of restaurants being opened overnight, and then the next night, the restaurant being closed, and um, thousands of people walking in and being given food for free, and then generations worth of money gone in in a matter of for my for my sake for my fictional sake i've condensed it to one summer i think in real life it was more like it took them about a decade but a lot of these trust fund hippies managed to wipe out entire fortunes and i just i've been thinking and thinking and thinking about that crash in part because i'm, I'm obsessed with crashes and bad things um and also in part because of when it happened 1962 and where it happened atlanta not New York, not San Francisco, not LA, Atlanta, where at the time in 1962, movie theaters are still segregated. And 
the senior classes of public schools have only been desegregated for one year by 10 students. Um, and it's, and again, it's Atlanta. There's no air conditioning. Um, I mean, it is a town that is ripe for change. And, and you lose 120 of your wealthiest citizens only to have a bunch of 14 to 40 year olds inheriting. It's like putting two people in a car. Something, something has to change. And, and I think Atlanta did change. And, um, you know, I definitely am manipulating the, the events in order to talk about the things that I want to talk about, money, art, race, um, but, and, and I wasn't there, but um, it's something I've thought about for a long time. So that, that book is slated for next fall. Wow, can't wait. <laughs> Thank seriously, you. seriously. Um, okay, questions? There's a mic over there and over there. If no one's brave enough to go to the mic, I am willing or Eliza is willing to repeat your question if you want to say it to the audience. Or I'll do what I do to my students and say, is anyone staying after class? Does anybody have a question for me that they're going to be asking after class? Maybe you could ask it now because somebody else has. See, it always works. Yes. So this is a two-part question in case people can't hear it. I know everyone here can, but they're also <laughs> recording it. Um, do I read poetry, and do I read poetry in translation in order to be inspired by the, tra the movement from one language into another? Um, I love poetry, yes. And when often when I cannot write, I will walk around, um, I was about to say apartment, but I don't live in an apartment anymore. I live in a house, which is sad, because I like apartments, because they're safe. Um, I, I, I walk around my apartment or my living room or my office with um, the Norton Book of Poetry open and I will read aloud, um, which I think is a habit I got from my sister, um, memorizing poetry, reading poetry. I love it. It's absolutely a go-to for me. Um, do I read poetry in translation? That would require me to speak any other language. Um, I, 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 have a, I have an interesting relationship with ancient Greek. Um, that doesn't exist if I don't have about 20 dictionaries next to me. Um, and that's, that's about the extent of my translating. Good question. I love poetry, though. I'm not a poet. Wow, okay. Um, so we've started with a, we've, we've gone to a pretty light question here. Um, <coughs> So the question is, has anything, and I want to make sure I get, I feel like this phrasing is wonderful, really terrible? Yes. Has anything really terrible happened in my life? Oh. Um, <laughs> can, I, can, I, can I do this instead? Can I say, is, I hope other people are as impressed with, like, with me as I am sometimes with my ability to obfuscate and not answer questions and like say, look at this shiny thing over here. Um, I mean, I'm making light of this very serious question in part because you've just asked such a, such a, such a serious question, um, which means I have to stop laughing at some point. Um, and that's what I feel like my, no, thank you. I know, I know. But now it's like, oh, wait until I say this. <laughs> She's not going to be laughing then, is she? <laughs> right. Uh, my, 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 uh, my adoptive dad died of stage 4B cancer, pancreatic cancer, um, and it took about 11 months. And the, the good news is, is it, it, it took about five months longer than it should have. And the bad news is it took about five months longer than it should have. Um, and, and I feel pretty comfortable saying that was, that was bad. Um, it was pretty bad. Yeah, but I, but one car accident um, for me, and nobody died. I totaled a car. Um, I think I've had one flat tire. Um, I mean, my odds. See, this is the other reason. Uh, my, I, I'm covered in about um, 3,002 moles. I've never had a malignant melanoma. My brother, who is covered in freckles with one mole, um, has had a stage two, I think. Um, and he's fine. He's totally fine. But you know, we're waiting. We're, we're all kind of waiting. Um, I feel like th we've been a little too lucky, and that's why I always like to talk about I can't die in a plane crash because the Washington Post will have to write about that tomorrow, and then I'll be famous. 
so I can, if the Washington Post is going to write about it tomorrow. Um, I would, yeah, cancer. I don't wish that on anyone. That's the that's the worst. It is. Yeah, it is. Unfortunately, I agree. Other questions? Yes. I have the same um, obsession with uh, plane crashes and dire, horrible things. So we have, just so everyone knows, we have a young woman in the front of the audience who has the same, the same um, obsession that she is saying I have with um, plane crashes and dire, what's, how, what's this? Dire whatevers that ever might happen to you. Okay. And I have four children that I have tried very hard to not pass that sort of um, obsession on to them. Yeah. Um, and it's just not going to happen. But just, just because I relate to that in me so much, and I can't tell honestly, like, to me, you could be 22. So I'm going to skip to the compliment of the evening. I am 22, according to the woman in the front, and she is my new favorite person in the world. Um, what I really want to know is, um, what did you read? I'm assuming that you're a huge reader. Yes. Um, what did you read that really kind of made you think, I do like reading. Hold on. So I will. So the question is, what did I read as a little girl? But I have to set up the. Um, I have to give you the setup for this, which is that this young woman has four children and she's very terrified of passing along her own um, obsession for catastrophic events to these four children. Um, but what did I read when I was little? Um, <laughs> that's great. That's great. It's, 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 it's a take on I walk to school and I carry my lunch, right? It's not the question. It's just I've got some information and a, maybe a question. Um, what color are your shoes? Um, I will tell you what I read as a little girl. But first, I have to tell you that if you are scared of passing along your obsession to your children, you probably already have. Um, my mother, unless this is apocryphal, and I'm, again, not handing her the microphone or looking at her if she raises her hand, but I believe she used to travel with her own black box um, in, the, in the 60s and 70s and 80s or whenever she started flying. But <laughs> I love this idea also that this black box was going to survive, but as I imagine it, because it is never, I mean, it's been, we've heard about it, but as I imagine it, it's um, like one of those little, it's like basic, this, this is so, this is so silly, but you know those black things that you put under your car to keep a key in? So I imagine something slightly larger than that that's magnetic, only she has wrapped it in, again, I, I actually, I don't think this part is apocryphal. I think this is real duct tape. Is it, oh, electric tape. Oh, it's electrical tape. They're definitely finding it, right? So, <laughs> so it's a black, it is literally in my mind, a black box. And also, literally, wherever it was, because it wasn't found, if she ever went down, it died too. Um, but it's wrapped in electrical tape. So, I mean, I'm scared of planes. And then there's my mom in the black box. So she and I don't remember her ever, you know, saying be scared of planes. And yet, so what did I read as a little girl? Um, my mom read aloud to us uh, every night, and that was one of my favorite things growing up. Um, and it 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 so it so became an obsession for me that I could not fall asleep at night without being read to which becomes a problem when you're in seventh or eighth grade, ninth or 10th grade, um, and then your parents get you a cassette tape player um, and you start getting literally books on tape. So once my mom stopped reading aloud to me because you know, at a certain point, you need that to a little bit of distance. Um, although I'm sure I would have been like, come in mom, <laughs> here, I'm reading The Power of One. <laughs> I'm, I'm reading Jane Austen. Would you like to read it to me instead? So I started listening to books on tape um, and some of my favorites, and I would say that these, these were very um, transformative because I think of them all the time still. One of them is uh, A Dog of Flanders. And perhaps you're familiar with this. Um, Nello and Patrash were alone in the world. They were friends in a friendship deeper than brotherhood. And Patrash was his dog, a dog of 
Flanders, high on the mountain. And it goes on, it goes on like this. Um, and I was obsessed with this. I think my mom got it for me and she'd never listened to it. I know this because I made her listen to it once with my sister. Can but I just yes. get in and just say that I happen to know that Hannah was a fantastic actress in high school too. Yeah. And it, it and and I, you just are you calling me, me a liar right now? <laughs> um. I, I hope that you return to the stage one day. Okay. Thank, keep, thank you. Keep, keep this is my stage, Eliza. <laughs> they can't leave. Um, so I, I I loved this story, and I think I think it, it was given to me um, sometime early middle school or late lower school, and I was still listening to it by the time that my sister was looking for colleges. So um, I was in late I was late middle school, just about to start high school maybe even um, and I remember we were leaving Atlanta and driving up to Annapolis to look at St. John's College and um, I had been begging my mom and my sister to listen to this story because I would always talk about a dog of Flanders and um, I think they finally I brought the cassette and they finally you know it's dark um, they put it in I fall asleep within five minutes right it's soporific for me at this point because I've been listening to it for about five years all I have to do is listen Nello and, and I'm like Right, so it's great. So I wake up several states later, um, and we're pulling into, as in my memory, which is obviously wrong, in my memory it's like midnight and we're pulling into St. John's College as if we're gonna stay there, which obviously can't be true, but maybe we took a tour, like we drove around it or something before the hotel, but this is my memory, and you can't disagree with my memory. Um, so I wake up, and my sister and my mom are in the front seat, and they're sobbing. Oh God, why? And so I sit up and I sort of rub my eyes and I say, Gee, what'd you think? <laughs> and my mom said, have you ever heard the end of this? And my sister said, she's never even heard the end of this. Why would she do this? Why would she make us listen to this awful story? It's the saddest thing I've ever heard. I'm sitting in the back, because you know, it's been five years that I've been listening to this every night. Um, and so they're up, they're up front weeping. And you know, I think my sister, because we had a very healthy, um, you know, low level animosity for a while, she's like, really? What happened? What happens in it? And I said, oh, spoiler alert, they all die. <laughs> And my sister and my mom are like red-eyed, weeping. They're like, why? Why would you do this to us? I was like, I love it, though. Don't you? But don't you love how the dog and the boy are holding on to one another? But he does win the art fair. He does. Like, he's won it. And my mom's like, but he's dead. And I said, right, but he's won it. So it all comes back to, you see how I just circled back to, I'm dead if I die in a plane crash. But maybe I've also won the Pulitzer. I don't know, but now I can't because I've just jinxed it. It's too bad. <laughs> it's busy up here. So did you yes. Ever think of putting a couple kids in the back seat when you were putting the story together, or just two people in the car with the rules? <laughs> well, to Chris, Chris was very clear on this: no children in the back seat. Um, did Did I ever consider putting children in the back seat, uh, or? Or is it, did, was it always a dog? Um, I never considered putting children in the back seat because I liked the tension of the, um, I learned this word from um, my friends Lily and Anthony a couple of years ago, dink, double income, uh, no kids. Uh, I, and I like this, this tension of the double income, no kid. Uh, and, and as a member of a dink, of a double income, no kid, I am fascinated by, uh, what people are willing to project onto you, you can't have kids. And so there's like this certain amount of sympathy. And of course, they don't know. I, maybe I can have kids. Maybe I'll never know because I don't want kids. Um, and of course, I have like a certain amount of sympathy for kids, like people with the two kids in the back seat. I'm like, it's okay. You can feel sorry for me. I will feel sorry for you. <laughs> we can still be friends. Um, we'll just hang out after eight when the kids go to bed. It's, I mean, I, to be fair, I'm free now. I know it's only four, but I will still be free at eight. Um, no, I didn't, I, I didn't want to because that's, that's something else I think a lot about. Um, I, I don't have kids and I don't want kids, but um, it, I, think, I, think, I think most people are lying if they don't, lying to themselves if they don't have that conversation at some point. And I, I've definitely had that conversation. Do I want them? Do I not want them? And I think specifically as a woman, you have to have that conversation. But no, this, this couple, it was really essential um, for, for the tensions. And especially, I will not give a spoiler alert to the ending. Um, 
though this will deliberately mislead you into thinking that you know what's going to happen, but it seemed essential to Mark's epiphany as well that they not have kids um, in order to get him where where he is. Um, so no, I did not consider that. Yes, hello. So the question is, did I know what the ending would be early on? Um, I, w one, th one thing that I do like about my writing process is that I, um, I try to stay pretty open to surprises. Um, and, and, I, and I try very hard not to have anything set in stone, or if it is, be willing to let it die, or kill it, or, or get rid of it, or save it more likely, because I am a hoarder in all things, copy, cut, and paste it to a different document, because I'll just use it there. Um, <clears throat> So no, I don't think that I knew that it would end the way that it was going to end. Um, I think there was a certain moment towards the middle of writing it when I realized what had to happen. Um, I, I also think that I really, really, really wanted someone. I wanted a little, I wanted there to be a murder. I imagined that there would be some very violent act. Um, and I am, this is also not spoiling it, but um, I'm disappointed in some ways that I did not quite find that ending, but I'm also really happy because I think I found the honest ending to this story. Um, so I went into it probably thinking too much of um, Hollywood loves talking dogs and vampires, and they also apparently recently like spouses that kill one another. Um, so I thought, if it happens, May, let's, uh, let's just be open to it. Maybe someone dies. I didn't get there because it wasn't honest. Um, it just wasn't the right ending for it. So I'm really happy with the ending. Though if anybody here reads Amazon reviews, you will find that many Amazon reviewers are not happy with the ending. And they would like a dead spouse as well. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, ben, do you have a question? Oh, so recommending Modiano. Um, I think it's either called the Honeymooners or Honeymoon. One of those two. Um, it has Honeymoon in the you know the origin, like in the in the uh, fundament, right? Um, or the other one is. I, I, this is wrong. This can't be the title. It's like let's not go to the neighborhood. That's wrong. But it's um, out and about in the neighborhood. Something neighborhood. It's 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 co sort of long and un unwieldy. Um, and it's I think those are my two favorites. Then and, and uh, they are. I I started reading him because Ann Beatty recommended him. Um, and they to me they read like they read like somebody else's memories having been put put just behind your eyelids, like they're extended flashes of something that's so visceral and so real. And you think, I experienced this. You're having the memory. You're not quite sure why. And somehow at the end of this Rolodex of bright lights and bright images, there's a story. And you just sit there thinking, how did somebody else get in my brain for for that for a couple hours? I don't know. I mean I I now think of these these books by Modiano as like my memories and I know they're not. But also nobody should trust my memories here, obviously. That's that's pretty clear. Um, good question though. I like to promote writers. <laughs> because he really needs promotion. Modiano. Uh, ben Warner, by the way, who just asked that question about um, Modiano, is the author, uh, the debut author of a book called Thirst um, that is absolutely stunning. And talk about taking the specific and finding the universal in it. Um, it's what if the world's water supply disappeared one day? And instead of some sort of macro impersonal view of, you know, I'd like to, the, the opposite of his book would be. Um, like uh, how Pepsi or Dr. Pepper would do the action sequence in those movies um, starring, insert, very popular, well-paid male actor here, where they show the, like the little kids in India running, you know, away from the fireball, and then they cut to like the little kids in California running from a different fireball. Instead, Ben's book is, there's this couple in a cul-de-sac, and that's who we watch 
while the world's water supply disappears without being told why. We're not looking at a ton of people, we're looking at two people and what happens to them and it is terrifying because I know, I, I, think, I think his wife did the exact same thing that I did when I was reading it the first time, which was put the book down about 20 pages in and walk downstairs and make sure that there are bottled, like many bottles of water. <laughs> like I remember hearing that Joanna did that and I was like, I did that too and we're good. We've got some water, we've got some water. Um, it, 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 it's, so you get a little bit of that gratifying terror um, and some catharsis it also is kind of practical because you're gonna make sure that you're okay with your water supply. So it's, it's a book of many trades. I highly recommend it. Thirst, Ben Warner. And yes, okay. whoa, one more question, not from you. Gosh, no. Um, you did have your hand up. Yeah. Oh, so, so the question is, how do I feel about my characters? Because when I read uh, the little bit aloud, it seemed like I sympathized with Mark so much, but then when I started talking about him, it seemed like I think he's a loser or something like that. Um, so I, I will answer that with an anecdote. Uh, so the first, my first novel is The Fates Will Find Their Way, and it, it follows the, the lives. It's, it's first person plural, and it's a group of about a dozen young men, and we follow them from about high school to um, middle age. You know, I'm putting that in quotes because right now I'm thinking 40s doesn't sound like middle age. I'm thinking 40s sounds like the good years. Um, and maybe middle age is more like 75. Um, so it follows them into the good years. Um, <clears throat> and so I, I wrote this book and I, I love the characters in this book. Um, I love these young men and I love this story because I feel like in many ways it's the book that I sort of have been trying to write for for 30, I, at the time I've been trying to write for about three decades and I, and I got it between two covers um, and, and I was so excited and I sent it to a friend of mine, Evelyn Hinckley, who we went to high school with, um, who was always my first round reader in high school and amazingly we were still friends and um, I sent it to her and she read it you know, in a day or two, which is what everybody likes to say about my books. You can read it in a day. I don't know if that's good or not. Um, I feel like there's some skimming. I want a book that's like, yeah, you're gonna read it in a couple of days. I don't know, this stuff's gonna happen, interrupt you. But um, so she read it in a day and she called me immediately and she said, Hannah, Hannah, I do not like these people. These are bad people. And I said, well, uh, what do you mean by bad people? And she said, these men are, there's nothing to recommend them. And I was like, no, 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 like they love each other, they're, they're friends and she said, but what they do to women, how they talk about women, I'm like, right, but, 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 but come on, like they love each other, and um, and and I was, and I at first I was really um, blown away and saddened, and um, part of that initial response was because they are all me. Uh, every single one of these young men I think of as me. There's the kid who wears the sweatshirt at the pool, um, you know, because he's a little bit too paranoid about like his gut. Um, and everyone's like, come on, just take the sweatshirt off. It's not a big deal. We're all quasi naked. Um, there's the kid who has to take the chocolate milk first and then pops the pill. I still to this day cannot take Advil without putting the water in first. So all of these kids, you know, they're me. And of course she's talking about Right, but ethically. Um, but I'm really attached to these like little details that I've given them that are part of me, um, which is what makes me love them. And I will say, I guess that's the long way of saying, um, I try very hard to look up at my characters instead of down at them. And Mark has foibles and he's impatient. And Maggie um, is highly problematic. And if you read the book, there will be times where you think, why do I have to be in a car with this woman? I mean, I know she was traumatized and I'm really, really sorry, but can I get out, right? Um, <clears throat> so, so they're both, they've, they've both got these, uh, you know, the, what I think are really real qualities to them, but, and, and at times, 
the reader will find themselves being really annoyed with them, I hope, in the same way that you, everyone is really annoyed with the person or people that they choose to spend their entire life with, whether it's a manufactured family, you know, a spouse, whatever. But um, the more you love them, the more capable you are of getting annoyed with them or disappointed with them. And um, I, I hope that when I am describing those annoyances, um, I'm being honest about it and I'm looking up at them and I'm thinking, okay, so Mark's impatient, but you know what else? He loves to hold Maggie's hand and read her poetry. He really loves it. Um, and, and Maggie, she loves the internet, but you know what she loves more? She loves to uh, you know, run her hand through Mark's hair. She just loves it. And it, she loves it because not of how it makes her feel, but because of how it makes him feel, right? So I'm just always trying to make sure that I'm not just picking like little funny things to make fun of people. I'm, tr I'm really trying to think, you don't like this, but you do like this, right? Um, because we're all annoying, I promise you. Everyone in this room has something that is not great about them, except for me. Um, and I think, I think that's it, right? On that note, because I am the only person who's not annoying in the room, right, I will sign books. Um, thank you guys so much. You were lovely, and those questions were awesome. Thank, thank you. you. And I'm very annoying. That was a joke, in case it didn't translate.